Hey guys, this is Dave Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene. Uh, in this video, I want to talk specifically about the COVID vaccines that are available and what we know about them at this point. Today is May 13th, 2021. Uh, I think that's important to, to mention because this situation with COVID is so rapidly changing. Now, in particular, I'm going to talk about the two mRNA-based vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, and then the one DNA-based vaccine, uh, produced by Johnson and Johnson. Now, the the messenger RNA-based vaccines. Let me move this out of the way for a minute here. Uh, are delivered in lipid nanoparticles, and um, there there's no real consensus as to which of these two conformations, A or B, the lipid nanoparticles with the RNA takes. But it seems like in the literature, people are leaning more towards A being a more stable conformation. So what you see in A here is a lipid monolayer with the hydrophobic tails facing inwards and the hydrophobic heads facing outwards into solution. And then on the inside, multiple inverted micelles of uh, upside down phospholipids with a messenger RNA on the inside interacting with the heads of the, um, of the phospholipids. Now, <clears throat> each of these little structures represents a, a different type of phospholipid. The green ones represent what are called pegylated lipids. Um, peg is polyethylene glycol. In research and to some degree in drug delivery, we've been using these lipid nanoparticles since the 60s. So we're not new to, to the lipid nanoparticles. We know their uses. We know some of the risks associated with them. And, and they've really been um, largely perfected over the last five, six centuries now. Um, and what researchers discovered early on was that just a, a straight phospholipid nanoparticle the immune system jumps on it and clears it before whatever its contents are can be delivered and since we need these messenger rnas to actually get inside host cells so they can be translated into proteins they, it turns out that by adding this polyethylene glycol to some percentage of the lipids on the outer surface of the nanoparticle the immune system um, the immune system kind of ignores it sometimes these are called stealth nanoparticles because the immune system ignores the particle itself, which is what we want, uh, long enough for the, for the lipid nanoparticle to deliver all these messenger RNAs inside cells where the protein that we're trying to, to develop an immune response can actually be produced. So in addition to these pegylated lipids, there are also some cationic lipids that are ionizable. Um, these blue ones are supposed to represent these cationic ionizable lipids. <clears throat> They're not heavily charged to begin with because it turns out that uh, more charged lipid nanoparticles are more toxic to humans. But uh, once they get into an acidic environment, such as inside the phagosome, the endosome inside a cell that brings it in is acidified, that causes these to become positively charged, and that actually forces them to fall apart. So it's an important part of them uh, releasing, of these nanoparticles releasing the messenger RNA from the endocytic vesicle as they get consumed by individual cells. There are some helper lipids in there, which are primarily phospholipids that help to stabilize them and make sure they traffic to the right locations within the cell. There's cholesterol, the little yellow squiggly guys here are representing cholesterol. And it turns out that the cholesterol adds uh, both some structural support to this membrane to keep the lipid nanoparticle physically intact which is what cholesterol does in our membranes as well. But also the cholesterol likely acts as the ligand, the binding molecule for the receptors on the surfaces of our various cells, especially our, our muscle tissue cells that have binding sites, receptors for uh, this type of, of cholesterol. And so this is really the ticket in to get inside the cell. We'll come back to this cholesterol and its role a little bit later. Now the uh, messenger RNAs that are, are trapped in these lipid nanoparticles. In the Moderna vaccine, the messenger RNA codes for the entire spike protein from the surface of the, um, of the COVID virus, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. The Pfizer vaccine is only a small portion of that spike protein. In both cases, it's only a single protein or a portion of a protein, which can instigate a good immune response, hopefully, without actually causing an infection. Let me check my notes, make sure there's there's nothing else I wanted to say about this. Uh, I think I'm good. Okay, good. Let's keep going. So the mRNA vaccines are delivered in these lipid nanoparticles, and the DNA vaccine 
uh, made by Johnson & Johnson is not delivered in a lipid nanoparticle, but instead is delivered in a virus. So it's delivered in a common cold virus called an adenovirus, and the specific one they're using is called adenovirus 26 or AD26. And so A, the worst it could cause is a cold. B, the genes, or at least one gene, in some cases it's multiple genes, and I'm not sure what Pfizer has done, so I think it's proprietary, but one or more genes that are involved in the virus replicating and making more of itself once it gets inside a cell have been deleted and removed from the DNA. So this isn't a messenger RNA virus, this is a double-stranded DNA virus. So one or more replication genes have been removed and replaced with a gene for the entire spike protein. And so in this case, we've got DNA being delivered as opposed to messenger RNA being delivered. And we'll see what some of the slight differences are there. Now, adenoviruses have been used for in the lab for about 30 years or so, about three decades, for delivering uh, drugs or delivering DNA to various cells. There are a couple vaccines that use adenoviruses uh, to be delivered, but they're in animals or uh, I think the rabies virus vaccines in animals, if I recall, in wild animals that are at high risk. Anyway, we don't have a ton of, of uh, experience using this viral vector in humans, but we have a ton of experience catching colds, and we know what we're up against. So it's not like this is a brand new idea to us. This is a non-enveloped, uh, for those of you in, in my microbio class, a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus from the adenovirus family and it's replication defective. So think of a cold virus that can get in but it can't replicate and if it can't replicate it can't cause an infection but instead what it does is it induces the cells that it got into to make this spike protein. Now the next question is what happens to these um, to these two different virus delivery vectors as they enter into the human cell? And there's a couple different things that we believe are happening as they enter the cell. Now this is an image of the lymphatic system. All these vessels are lymph ducts and scattered throughout the lymph ducts are all kinds of lymphoid and secondary lymphoid tissues and organs like lymph nodes. We're going to use lymph nodes as our main example of where the B cell um, uh, uh, selection and proliferation is going to take place because largely it is the lymph nodes, the hundreds of lymph nodes that are bodies that are responsible for this. So the immune system has two main branches, the cell-mediated or T-cell branch and the antibody-mediated or B-cell branch. And, and we really want our vaccines to uh, activate both branches. If you don't remember how that works, go back to the previous video on how vaccines in general work. Um, but the B-cell-mediated or antibody-mediated humoral branch of the immune system really requires that the pathogen itself get drained to nearby lymph nodes where it encounters B cells that consume it, um, digest it, present antigens on the surface, get confirmation from the helper T cell, and then start secreting lots of antibodies. So the B cell portion of this response is going to be taking place in the nearby lymph nodes. So when the vaccine is hitting the deltoid muscle tissue, there's going to be fluid drainage, which there is all the time anyway, to the uh, lymph nodes in this armpit, whichever arm you chose to get your vaccine in. And those armpit lymph nodes are going to uh, have plenty of B cells for these, either the lipid nanoparticle to get picked up or for the adenovirus to get picked up, in which case then the, the protein will be produced, it'll be displayed on the surface, and all the steps that you've learned about in previous videos will uh, take place. So the B cell response is going to require that the whole pathogen, which in this case the whole pathogen is our lipo lipid nanoparticle or our adenovirus vector, each of which is carrying either RNA or DNA, gets delivered into uh, and drained into those localized, um, those localized uh, 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 lymph nodes. Okay. Um, and then if you remember from the earlier video about, uh, about vaccines and our primary goal of vaccines, the primary goal is to develop what's called immunological memory. And so the memory B cells, in addition to circulating antibodies, are going to be produced through this process of drainage of the, um, of the vector with its messenger RNA or DNA into the lymph nodes. 
Okay, let's keep looking. So in addition to the B cell response, antibody mediated immunity needing to be activated, we also need to activate a cell mediated immune response and in particular to build up T-cell based memory, so memory T-cells. And these are critical, especially with viral infections like these, but they do become important with many bacterial infections too. So here's the human body with a bunch of muscles. It's this deltoid right here where our injections are being given, right? This is an intramuscular, these are intramuscular injections. And so the question becomes, well, when we when we inject these vaccines into the muscle tissue, what's the fate of the lipid nanoparticles or the adenoviruses? There are local dendritic cells and macrophages, very important phagocytic cells, that are scattered throughout this material. And those can actually pick up the lipid nanoparticle or the adenovirus, the AD26 virus carrying our, our uh, in that case, DNA. Once they pick it up, as if it was a foreign pathogen invading them, they can travel back to the lymph nodes in the armpit, and those antigen-presenting cells, the phagocytic cells, can present the antigens to the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells and activate a cell-mediated response. What does that look like at the cellular level? If this represents a dendritic cell or a macrophage uh, let's not look on the left hand side for that's a, that's a different type of that's like naked mRNA um, being added as opposed to being brought in in, a, in a, a lipid nanoparticle. On the right, we've got it in a lipid nanoparticle. The lipid nanoparticle itself carrying the messenger RNA is going to be picked up by the macrophage of the dendritic cells. There are uh, pattern recognition receptors on the surface of this antigen presenting cell like toll-like receptors, for example, that can recognize some of the molecules on the surface here of our lipid nanoparticle. They're going to get brought in where the messenger RNA is going to be released into the cytoplasm. It's going to be translated into protein, and then it's going to be displayed on the surface with MHC. And then the MHC peptide complex being presented will be presented after this migrates through the lymph material to the B cells in particular, pardon me, the T cells in particular, both helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells, activating both um, an effector response right then and there as if you were being infected, but also that memory T cell response that's going to be so important for later secondary exposures. All right. <clears throat> now, the in addition to there being these antigen-presenting cells, macrophages and dendritic cells, that can present antigen because there are these professional antigen presenting cells in the in the muscle tissue it turns out that the muscle tissue itself can actually take up the delivery system whether it's the adenovirus vector or the the lipid nanoparticle vector and so in this case this image is showing the adenovirus vector showing up the adenovirus vector is uh, is going to hit the surface of our muscle cells in the deltoid specifically and there's going to be an interaction between uh, proteins on the surface of the adenovirus and a particular receptor called the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor or the car receptor this receptor it's not there for the sake of picking up viruses that would be silly it's there for cell to cell connection it's an adhesin we call it it's it's a um, an adhesion type protein that holds two cells together and so they become the target the landing zone the receptor for ligands on the surface of in this case an adenovirus and so once that adenovirus attaches to this Coxsackie adenovirus receptor, it triggers endocytosis where a vesicle is brought in. And inside that endosome, um, there's some decent understanding of this. I'm not going to get into it for, for, uh, for this particular video. But there is escape from the endosome that has to do with acidification. And uh, these little knob proteins here associated with the... Uh, with the tail fibers. Once we've got nothing but nucleocapsid, so we have a, a polyhedral capsid with our double-stranded DNA inside, it's actually going to intentionally get trafficked or delivered along microtubules to the surface of the nucleus where the, the viral DNA is going to get 
inserted into the nucleus. And in the nucleus is where we see transcription taking place. So transcription of the gene for the spike protein will take place. That mRNA will then get exported back out of the nucleus where it's going to encounter um, ribosomes. Those ribosomes will dock on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the protein itself will end up getting displayed on the surface. The, the, the spike protein itself will end up getting displayed on the surface of the muscle cells. So this is with an adenovirus, double-stranded DNA, relatively complex set of steps. But in the end, what you have are muscle tissue, human muscle tissue cells with, with COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins displayed on the surface. We'll come back to that and what that means in just a minute. Now, when it comes to the, um, the mRNA vaccines with the lipid nanoparticle, instead, it's very similar, but now we've got RNA and we've got a lipid nanoparticle. We don't have an adenovirus. And so what's going to happen here is this lipid nanoparticle is going to interact with the surface of our muscle tissue cells. And while some people have talked about possible membrane fusion, from what I've been reading in the literature, that's a lot less likely than endocytosis. So what will happen is the cholesterol that was intentionally added to the surface of this lipid nanoparticle will bind to um, what are called LDL cholesterol receptors on the surface of the human muscle cell, and that will trigger endocytosis. Once it's on the inside, there's an acidification of this endosome, which if you remember, there are these ionizable cationic lipids in here that then become highly positively charged. And there's something about that high positive charge that causes it to break apart and to break apart the endosome as well. So what ends up releasing from this whole thing is just the messenger RNA. Now, because we're already in the form of messenger RNA, we don't have to transcribe it. Nothing has to enter the nucleus. Simply a ribosome is going to grab hold of it, attach to uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the spike protein, whether it's whole spike or the part uh, portion of the spike protein, will get displayed on the outer surface of the cell. So at that point, <clears throat> whether regardless of the two vectors, whether it's the, the adenovirus vector or the lipid nanoparticle vector, what we end up with, in addition to our B cells getting activated by drainage to the lymph nodes and our uh, some of our cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells getting activated by direct consumption of these particles by the antigen presenting cells, the two phagocytes we talked about, macrophages and neutrophils, we also now have a region of human muscle cells that are displaying COVID spike proteins. So what happens to those COVID spike proteins? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. There are a few different things that can happen to that COVID spike protein that allow the protein to be presented on an antigen-presenting cell, typically in the lymph nodes. Let's take a look. First is direct presentation. It's what we just talked about, where the antigen-presenting cell, that would be a, 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 a macrophage or... Uh, possibly a neutrophil, but most likely a macrophage or a dendritic cell, is going to consume the virus, and then that whole thing, that whole unit, is going to drain to the lymph node and present antigens from it to the various T cells, T helper and cytotoxic T cells. Another possibility is what's called cross-presentation, where the muscle cells get infected, and the muscle cells actually display that spike protein like we just talked about, and the antigen-presenting cells can actually consume some of those displayed proteins, like they're grazing along the surface. They can take up some of those displayed proteins off the surface, represent them themselves, and drain to the lymph node and present to, uh, present to helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Or, and this one's the craziest of all, something called cross-dressing presentation. This is the coolest, where... An antigen-presenting cell, like a dendritic cell, takes up the pathogen. In this case, it's just a delivery vehicle. It produces the spike protein, displays the spike protein on its surface, but then actually shares portions of its membrane with another dendritic cell 
or another antigen presenting cell. And then one or the other can then drain to the lymph node. So a portion of the membrane of, say, a macrophage can actually be shared with uh, the a dendritic cell, and then the dendritic cell can drain to the lymph node. So there are multiple ways that this, this pathogen and its antigens can find its way to the uh, to the lymph nodes where it's going to present antigen to the cytotoxic T cells and to the helper T cells. Now there are also two others called local presentation that I got to be honest I don't understand as well not being an immunologist but it turns out that either infected APCs right so a, a dendritic cell or a macrophage can pick it up or the dendritic cell or macrophage can pick it up off the surface of infected muscle cells and then turn around and present it to wandering T cells. Now, many of our T cells are, are found in the lymph nodes, but some of them are in circulation. And so there can be some presentation of antigen not in the lymphoid organs, but right there at the tissue itself, or local presentation without antigen presenting cells. This is the one that blows my mind because I think of antigen presenting cells as being necessary to present the antigen to the helper T cells and the cytotoxic T cells. But there's some evidence that the infected muscle cells covered in the spike protein that they just produced can actually present antigen directly to migrating or wandering helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells right there in the local region without having to go all the way to the uh, the uh, the lymph node lymph node region such as in the armpit so lots of possible ways that these antigens can get delivered essentially and ultimately presented to the lymph nodes in order or to helper t cells and cytotoxic t cells locally even in order to stimulate a t cell response a cell mediated response and build that cell mediated uh, memory okay couple final comments I want to make about the three different vaccines themselves and then we'll end this video because this has been a long difficult one I understand the Pfizer vaccine uh, is a, an mRNA based vaccine and the mRNA codes for uh, a portion of the COVID spike protein the portion called the receptor binding domain so the RBD portion of it it's not the entire thing this one has been approved for ages 16 and up and honestly by now I think some of these ages are starting to come down over the last few days. Uh, I heard something about 12 years old and up. Right now I'm getting, these were the standard numbers as of a few days ago. Um, it had to be stored, this is tricky, the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored really, really cold between minus 80 and minus 60 degrees Celsius. That's specialized freezer temperature. That's not your regular average freezer. And so that has proven to be a little difficult. It's given in two doses at 30 micrograms each. The first dose seems to prime the immune system. The second dose seems to give a, a much bigger and healthier response and a lot of memory from it. And they need to be approximately 21 days apart. Now, what do we know from the, from the clinical trials that led to this vaccine being approved in the first place? Well, there are a little over 36,000 uh, participants in the clinical trials. So this isn't a small group over 36,000 people. Half of them got placebo, bummer for them, half got a vaccine. In the placebo group over the next eight weeks, 162 of them got COVID-19 and got sick. In the vaccinated group over the next uh, six to eight weeks, eight of them got sick. So eight people got sick with the vaccine, despite the vaccine, 162 got sick when they were on placebo. And in the vaccinated group, there were no severe cases, no cases that qualified as being severe, and there were several severe cases in the placebo group. So this represents a 95% rate of protection. The, um, the application for an emergency use authorization that was submitted says that there was some level of protection after the first dose, but there wasn't enough replication, it wasn't controlled, etc. So they can't say for sure that one dose is going to be sufficient, but it does appear that the first dose does give some protection, and it's certainly better than nothing. Um, and then protection appeared to be similar across all demographics, and that's true for the two mRNA vaccines. There was a little more of a demographic division with the, um, with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But because these tests only went out to two months, we don't know how long the protection lasts beyond those two months. 
Now that we're further into this, there's some evidence that it's at least eight months of protection. I'm not positive how much uh, further beyond that the protection is going to last. Now the Moderna vaccine is the entire spike protein encoded on a messenger RNA. This one's approved for ages 18 and up, but the storage is a little bit better, minus 20. Minus 20 is your regular old kitchen freezer. So this is uh, a lot simpler, a lot easier to find storage for. Again, two doses with, with much bigger slugs, 100 micrograms of the vaccine per dose. And these are four weeks apart instead of three weeks apart. The original clinical trials, not quite as big, but almost over 30,000 participants, half with placebo, half got vaccine. And in the first couple of weeks, 90 COVID cases arose in the placebo group and five arose in the vaccine group. And in the vaccine group, there were zero severe cases. So again, it appears to be providing good protection. We're calling this a 94% rate of protection. Um, and there was, in this case, they said 80% protection after one dose after 28 days. But again, it was a small, non-randomized study group, so um, no one feels real confident suggesting or recommending only one dose, partly because we don't know if that full um, cell-mediated immunity was truly activated with only a single dose. It appears that that cell-mediated immunity really does benefit from that second dose, and that cell-mediated immunity is really important for viral infections. Protection, again, similar across all demographics and unknown levels of protection uh, beyond the two months. And then finally, for comparison, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This is the entire spike protein, but this time it's on DNA instead of messenger RNA. So it has the added steps of first needing to be transcribed prior to being translated, approved for ages 18 and up. This one's the easiest of all the storage because it's it's not in a lipid nanoparticle and it's not messenger RNA. It can be stored at refrigerator temperature for up to three months, two to eight degrees. That's just your regular old fridge. And one dose, we're not talking micrograms anymore, we're talking in terms of virus count, has five times 10 to the 10th virus particles. Uh, 10 to the 9th would be a billion. So 5 times 10 to the 9th would be 5 billion, 5 times 10 to the 10th is 50 billion virus particles is the dose that's in there. You get a single dose, and that single dose appears to be sufficient to get really good cell-mediated activation and, uh, and B-cell or um, um, humoral activation. The original clinical trials, almost 40,000 people, half placebo, half vaccine. In the placebo group, 348 of them got covid uh, obviously not because of the vaccine, but during this, this 28 days or so, they got COVID. Um, in the, uh, the the vaccination group, 116 got COVID, and none were considered severe, and there were no deaths. So that's a 67% rate of protection. Lower rate of protection, but still a very good. If you compare that to influenza, which is somewhere between 50 and 60% protection, and if we get good herd immunity with influenza, we can survive um, influenza outbreaks year after year. And so 67% is actually quite high. I read at one point that prior to um, prior to any of the vaccines being approved, the, the target rate of protection was 50%. And so the fact that, that our worst one is at 67 and our best is at 95% says that, that we've got, we're onto something really good here with these DNA and RNA vaccines. Uh, protection was similar across all demographics, though honestly there was a little more diversity across certain age groups and uh, possibly certain um, ethnicities and unknown protection beyond two months, as we said before. Now, all three vaccines have essentially the same, uh, you could call them reactogenic side effects. Side effects that happen for sure within seven days after the vaccine, but typically within the first day or two. And they included pain at the injection site, which was very common, something like 80% of everybody that got it had a sore shoulder after getting one of these vaccines. Tiredness, also very high percentage. Headache, muscle pain, and then in lower percentages, chills, joint pain, and uh, fever at a very low percentage. Well, not, not rare, but low for these common side effects. And for most people, the side effects were gone within four days. The Johnson & Johnson was the shortest window of side effects. For most people, it was less than 48 hours. Whereas with Pfizer, those side effects, it wasn't too uncommon for them to last up to four days. And we've all talked to people who have had side effects, sometimes really, really uncomfortable side effects um, that lasted a week or even longer than a week. And so different immune systems interacting in different ways. Keep in mind that 
none of those side effects is likely to cause any sort of long-term harm to you as opposed to COVID, which we know has very high risks associated with causing long-term harm to you. And then all three vaccines, since the original clinical trials, I, I updated this data on the 10th, so a few days ago, there were greater than 259 million doses in the U.S. Two rare but serious side effects have popped up. Um, anaphylaxis, in other words, a severe uh, allergic response. And so far, most of the people that have had an anaphylactic response uh, have been people who have had anaphylaxis to other types of things, whether it's latex or shrimp or something along those lines. And so their immune systems are already primed for a super hyper response like that. And so something that needs to be considered and watched out for. And then something called TTS, which is a form of blood clotting. Uh, very few, very rare. I think there were six cases in the first million doses of Johnson & Johnson. Um, and there have been a handful more since then. I think 15 total after something like 7 or 8 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. So again, very serious, fortunately very rare, especially rare compared to what we see with people getting COVID and how frequently they get COVID and how nasty COVID can be. So uh, the morbidity and mortality rates associated with that. So no long-term side effects have been reported. And what they mean by that is side effects that typically show up within the first six weeks and then last, we've had five months to watch for those, and we're not seeing any, um, any significant long-term side effects. Some people have reported things like uh, tiredness lasting longer for a couple of months, for example, which also happens with COVID itself. Um, so anyway, no, no significant long-term side effects have been reported in these five months, and so the safety profile looks very similar to a lot of other vaccines that we deal with. Okay, let's summarize this long video. Make sure you guys are all on the same page with me. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines consist of messenger RNA delivered in nanoparticles, whereas the Johnson & Johnson vaccine consists of, a, of DNA delivered in a replication-deficient de cold virus, a cold virus that can't replicate and cause uh, infection itself. Antibody-mediated immunity, that's the B-cell immunity, is activated when the AD26 carrier or the lipid nanoparticle carrier, when after it gets inoculated, it physically drains to the lymph nodes and it's consumed by B-cells, which then go through their whole process. And then cell-mediated immunity appears to be activated when phagocytes that are present in the, in the, the muscle tissue present antigen to T-cells in the lymph nodes, and there's several different ways that these phagocytes in the muscle tissue can actually get a hold of those antigens uh, and we talked quite a bit about those. So thank you for taking time to think through this entire thing. One more before I forget, sorry, protection ranges from 67% to 95% which is really really excellent. The more people we can get vaccinated in that range um, then the, the more likely we're going to be able to hit herd immunity. Thank you for taking you know more than half an hour to go through this whole long message with me. But what I'd like you to do is watch it a few times. If you're one of my students, you need to watch it a few times because there's going to be information on this on the next couple of exams. If you are going into healthcare, you need to know this. You need to understand this. And if you're just watching this because you want to learn and understand, I hope you found that, uh, that it was a useful process to you to think through some of the science of these vaccines. In the last three slides, I'm going to show them slowly. You can click pause. But what I've done in the last three slides is uh, listed out all of my sources for all of this information. So you can see these references here. <clears throat> um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices reports. Um, a report on nanotechnology in the COVID-19 vaccines from the American Chem Society. Um, an article from... Uh, the journal Science Immunology, three important websites, the FDA, the CDC, and the European Medicines Association, um, a site called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which is how uh, we crowdsource adverse events following vaccines, the VAERS system, and that data is publicly available. Uh, a very helpful blog from uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, an article from the Journal of Immunology, uh, the FDA application for the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the FDA briefing document as they uh, evaluated the Moderna vaccine, 
the FDA briefing document as they evaluated and recommended uh, the EUA for um, for the Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That's the adenovirus vaccine. And then an article in the journal Frontiers in Immunology by Linda Coughlin. Feel free to go back to those and pause them. And you can simply copy and paste any of these and search for them if you'd like to find the original sources yourself. Thanks for watching.